Roger, Roger, 5905. A correction, Whiskey for Echo, Echo, Yankee. We're ready. Well, it's so good to see you all again. It's a little bit of a rush tonight getting everything together because we had so many extra pieces. I've got some show and tell stuff up here because the last section we'll be talking about tonight is test equipment. I wasn't going to be talking about this actually as a part of the class presentation, but during break and afterwards, if we have time, feel free to come up. Most of the test equipment items that are mentioned in the book um, we have uh, on the table here and I'll have some recommendations as we go along as well. Welcome to our online people. We did have one student join us as a new student online, so we're happy to, happy to have, have her from Maryland. And um, any questions from last week? Ho hopefully you worked through the, uh, some of the problems and made them your own, I hope. <laughs> the alternative is to memorize, but um, uh, we, we'd really like you to know how to do it, at, at least having gone through it once, more than anything else that we want you to pass your test. So what, whatever you need to do to make that happen. I didn't get any phone calls or emails, so that means everybody knows it really well or gave up. <laughs> Not sure which, but I, I, you did so well last week. I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of you got it. Um, a few updates have come out uh, via the email. Gary sent one. Um, the, just about all the math that is in chapter four recovered last week. So that's, that's good news. We have just a few very small things tonight. Probably won't even need your calculator, but that doesn't hurt to, to get it. Um, what I'd like to start off with, if you could find that general reference uh, handout that we passed out last week. to find one here myself. Okay, that's this one here that has the, the two magic circles on it. All right, yep, um, you can have, yep, I got a spare. Come on up and get it, I'll grab another one. There you go. Very good. So the good news is that uh, we've really covered everything on this first page last week, except just one, one line. So, and the one that we didn't talk about was the, the line that has reactants on it. So just for review, we've been through the, uh, all of the unit conversions on the top. We spent a lot of time talking about the formulas. We talked about the three new formulas for this class. Does anybody remember who Paco was? What's that? He's the elephant. Yeah. yeah. And what's the rest of it? He's sat on top of the refrigerator. Yeah. No. Yeah. You, you got it. All right. And then we had Emily. And Emily is the root of public relations. All right. And what was the other one? The raccoon. Yeah. What was his name? Um, Presley. Presley. Right. And what, what, what was special about Presley? He's insane. Yes. So Presley was the irritated, insane raccoon. Yep, good. So uh, see how easy that is? You, th you thought this was gonna be hard stuff. And then translating that into the, into the calculator, of course, you'll have to work on that on your own. Uh, we covered it all last week. So we'll be talking about the reactance line this week and the uh, peak and, and uh, RMS. We covered that in depth last time. And, and then the DV ratios down at the bottom. So if, if you can just handle this one page, you've got all of the math virtually for the entire uh, exam. So I wanted to review that. At least all of the hard stuff. One thing I've been mentioning or wanting to do, and I keep forgetting, there's a, a book called the ARRL's General Q&A, and I'll have this in the email as well. And what this is, um, as you're going through doing the chapter reviews from week to week, uh, sometimes you'll get to a question and you're not sure why you got the question right or you got it wrong. 
And what's very nice about this is all of the questions are in order numerically. So if you get stuck, um, like I just picked one at random here, G7AO5, which is one we'll have tonight, what portion of the AC cycle is converted to DC by a half-wave rectifier? And it's got the four answers there. And then, and this is what I love about this book, it gives you a very brief, concise description of why that question uh, is there and what the correct answer is. And it says, since there are 360 degrees in a full cycle of AC, a half-wave rectifier converts 180 degrees of the AC input waveform to DC. And that gives you the page number in the book. So when you get stuck, it's, it's a little prompt to remind you what the theory was be behind that question. Um, and highly recommend. This is about uh, 20 bucks. I think I get an instructor's discount. Past students uh, have spoken very highly of these. So if that's something you're interested in, let me know. I, I can order one for you. OK, with that, we'll jump into the good stuff here. It's all good tonight. We have a little bit more material than we had last week, but it'll go a lot faster because we won't be spending a lot of time calculating things. So reactance and impedance is section 4.4, and it jumps right in immediately with blue text. So you'll need to pay attention to this. Let me turn on my laser here. Here we go. So reactance is the opposition to the flow of alternating current caused by capacitance or inductance. And there's several things in that statement that um, are, are worth mentioning. Now, there's several kinds of um, units that represent the opposition to the flow of current. And we'll be reviewing all of those tonight. Reactance is one of those three. The other is impedance and resistance. But reactance is caused by only inductance or capacitance. So that's a key. And we'll go over the other two types as well. The symbol is X. Reactance is X. X sub C is capacitive reactance. X sub L is inductive reactance. And the good news is you won't have to calculate any of these from the formulas. I gave you the formulas on the sheet uh, because there's uh, something about the way they appear that will help you remember some of the things you'll see on the test. Get to that in a minute. Reactance is measured in ohms, like resistance. So you can have so many ohms of reactance or so many ohms of resistance. They're both opposition to the flow of current, AC current, we're moving into tonight. And here are those formulas. And I'd like to spend a minute uh, talking about how you can interpret these. Anytime you have a formula that is something equal to something, that's a direct relationship. And what I mean by that is that the inductive reactance value, whatever number of ohms that turns out to be, if anything over on this side of the uh, formula <clears throat> increases, the inductive reactance will increase. So that if this increases, it'll increase here and vice versa. That, that's called a direct relationship. So the thing that's unique about reactance is frequency comes into play now with, with uh, just DC resistance. We didn't care about frequency at all. With reactants, capacitors and coils change their characteristics depending upon the frequency that uh, you apply to them. So that's why we see this F term for frequency. L is inductance in Henry's and 2 pi, we all know what 2 pi is. It's apple and cherry, right? Mm -hmm. yep. XC, now notice that we've got one over, one over. This is called an inverse relationship because if as the frequency increases, what do you think will happen over here? It'll decrease. It'll decrease. Yep, so that's what an inverse relationship is all about. And there's two questions in the pool uh, related to reactants, and one of them asks, uh, if the frequency increases, what happens to the uh, reactants, or vice versa? We'll get to the exact words. But if you can kind of remember what this formula looks like, you'll be able to answer the question. There's another case that we've seen. Remember the frequency and wavelength combination? As wavelength goes down, frequency goes up, right? That's an inverse relationship. So understanding what a direct and an 
and inverse relationship will help you answer some of the questions that you come across without have to, having to memorize the formula. Now, the book actually goes through and does some calculations on these, but that's not required for any of the pool questions. We'll get to that when we get to the extra material in January. We all want you to join us for that. Right now, you're just scared to get through the general, right? <laughs> but you'll make it. All right, and here it's as stated again, as frequency increases, inductive reactance increases. The direct relationship for capacitive reactants as the frequency increases, frequency over here, the capacitive reactance will decrease. So if you can keep those straight, it'll help you. Here's some graphs. This is fairly low frequency. This is frequency in hertz, but the, here it's shown graphically. Um, and here we've got red. This is inductive reactance. It's showing as the frequency is increasing, the reactance in ohms is also increasing, just, just like we said it would, and the graph bears that out. This is just to help reinforce what we talked about. Capacitive reactance, you see, is just the opposite. As the frequency increases from 20 to 30 to 40 hertz, the reactance is, in ohms is decreasing. There's something that something magic happens at a certain frequency. You can see that at one specific frequency, in this case it's 50 hertz, the inductive reactants and the capacitive reactants are exactly equal. That's very significant. That's called resonance, and we'll be talking a lot more about that as we move forward. But at some point in time, this magic point called resonance occurs. When these, go ahead. So you shift those lines with uh, inductors and capacitors, mm -hmm. you can shift those lines. Right, the val it's the value values. of the inductance or the capacitance. The more picofarads, less picofarads, more millihenries, less millihenries, we'll, we'll shift it around and they'll behave according to the formulas that are, that are on your sheet. But I wanted you to be able to see this graphically. In RF work, ham radio, um, of course these values, are, our frequencies are much higher than this, they're in megahertz. But this showed the relationships very nicely, so I wanted to put that up. Okay, what unit is used to measure reactants? It's ohms, right, just like resistance in DC. What is reactance? Remember, there's one element that's new here that has to do with frequency. Okay, opposition of the flow of alternating current caused by capacitance or inductance. How does a capacitor react to AC? This is going to be our direct and inverse relationship. We'll, we'll give you this answer if you can remember that. Okay, I don't know if I heard a B there, but as the frequency of, of the AC increases, the reactance decreases because a capacitor has that inverse relationship. So all you have to know is as frequency goes up, does the reactance go up or down for a capacitor or an inductor? Those are the only two questions that, that are there. And they're nicely implied from, from the formula, if, if that's a help to you. Oh, here's the other one. How does an inductor react to AC? As the frequency goes up. Yes, you see how that worked? Good, and those are pretty much all the pool questions on reactants. Reactants is uh, kind of a complex, scary subject, but there's not a, a whole lot that you need to know other than those basic principles that we talked about. Oh, here's, here's another one. Which of the following causes opposition to the flow of alternating current in an inductor? See, they come at you every which way with some of these things, but it, it's the same words that we've been talking about the whole time. It's reactants, yes. The opposition of flow, to AC in an inductor. And of course, if the next question is capacitor, it's gonna be the same answer. Oh, look at that. Opposition of the flow, AC reactants for a capacitor. Resonance, remember we saw where the inductive and capacitive reactance curves crossed each other. That was the magic point uh, known as resonance. 
aren't any pull questions on this, but it's good just to be aware of. Um, resonance in a circuit or antenna occurs when capacitive and inductive reactants are equal. We saw that. And th this is interesting. In a resonant series circuit, which this is, we've got an AC source, we've got a coil and a capacitor in series with each other, and a, a load resistor, I guess you could call this. In a resonant circuit, resonant series circuit, the reactances of L and C cancel, forming a short circuit leaving only the resistance, R, as the circuit's impedance. So when we get to the point of resonance, the only thing that this AC generator can see is the load. And what we've effectively done with those values picked exactly the way uh, that, that they'll match is that we have peaked those values so that primarily that one frequency will pass. And that is so important in radio because you're, you're tuning um, the, you want the ability to tune one end of the band to the other, and how do you select the frequencies from the low end of the band to the, to the upper end of the band? Well, the, it, it all has to do with, uh, with resonance and the tuned circuits that are in the radio. So that's, that's just a little flavor of things to come. And resonance, of course, then is used in filters and tuned circuits to pass or reject specific frequencies. You'll be hearing a lot more about that coming up but no test questions, <clears throat> except for this one. Now, self-resonance, and this, this one was new in this edition of the manual, and uh, it, it was uh, pretty interesting that they included it. So we'll talk about self-resonance, and here's a coil. The space between the turns on an inductor have a small amount of, and I added the word parasitic, capacitance. So we don't intend for that capacitance to be there. We, we want it to act like a coil. But those, uh, between every pair of windings, there is some amount of capacitance. And of course, there's capacitance to any, any place else that might be there, from the coil turns to ground in, in this case. So we've got some um, capacitance here in, in a coil. At lower frequencies, it's going to be very, uh, very minor, of course. The capacitive reactance becomes smaller at higher frequencies. Remember our formula, our direct relationship? The inductive reactance becomes larger at higher frequencies. So at some magic frequency, they're going to be equal, right? At some frequency, the inductive and capacitive reactance will be equal, and we have what's called self-resonance. And above the self-resonant frequency, the inductor will become capacitive. And that's pretty amazing, because you, you think you've got an inductor, but if you were to measure it on, on, a, on a meter, you'd see that it was actually a capacitor <laughs> at that frequency. That's what happens when you go past the point of, of resonance. So this question is in the pool. So these effects, because uh, inductance and capacitance are, are going in opposite directions on the graph, at some point they're going to cross. At the point that they cross, the circuit becomes resonant. Or in this case, we're talking about a component. It has just become self-resonant. And if we continue to go up in frequency, the inductance will become the minor part of the reactants and the capacitive reactants will become dominant, and the coil will actually look like a capacitor. How Isn't do you that... counteract for that? Say that? How do you counteract for that? Uh, by the design of the parts, uh, the frequencies that are, are used. They spec that frequency when you buy a molar inductor? Uh, I don't think so. I, I haven't seen it, but um, just be aware that, that it's there. Yep. Any experience with that? For now, all you need to know is that, uh, that this, this actually can happen, especially when you get to higher frequencies, UHF and above. And HF, I don't think you'll see this happening, happening very often. But because there's a pool question, we had to talk about it. It gave me an excuse to go through all of that. In fact, uh, self-resonant frequency occurs within a home radio band, mm -hmm. and you transmitting at that frequency, it will burn that pin circuit up. It, it could, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's, there's some weird effects that can happen at RF, but you won't see anything too much like this until you get into UHF and above. 
but it's there. Okay, impedance is the next one. So we had two kinds of opposition to the flow of AC. One was just resistance, the other was reactance. The third one is impedance. Now impedance is opposition to the current flow in an AC circuit when resistance and reactance are combined. Combination of resistance and reactance. It's denoted by the letter Z. It's also measured in ohms. So we got lots of things that are measured in ohms. And this, this is from our, our book. It says the ratio of vol uh, voltage to current. And they're asking, since we don't know what's in the black box, is it uh, a resistor and a capacitor? Is it a resistor and a coil? Uh, how would we be able to figure it out? You don't have to do this <laughs> for, for the general test. How do we be able to figure it out? The answer is if you can increase the frequency of the, the AC and see if the current increases or decreases, you can tell if inside the black box you've got something that's capacitively reactive or inductive, inductive reactance uh, adding into the equation. But that's something that we're, we're not going to get into. If, if, it, if it was resonant, actually the current would change if you went up or down in frequency because they would be equal. But I'll let to say this, impedance is a combination of resistance and reactance. And it's measured in ohms. And it's the third opposition of the flow of current in an AC circuit. And I put this little table together just to help demystify some of this. At least I hope it does for you. So types of resistance to AC flow, we've got pure resistance, we've got reactance, and we've got impedance. We've already looked at the symbols, R, X sub C or X sub L, and Z. They're all measured in ohms. Does the value vary with frequency? In the case of pure resistance, no. With reactance and impedance, because coils and capacitors are involved, definitely yes. The value will vary with frequency. So notes, pure resistance is the same as DC resistance. Reactance is unique to AC. And the value changes with frequency, as is impedance. So I don't know if this will tie some of the pieces together for you, but they're all measured in ohms. And only two of them are affected by frequency. Practice. What happens when an inductor is operated above its self-resonant frequency? So an inductor is normally um, inductive. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, it becomes capacitive. Only question like that. What is impedance? Okay, remember, impedance was the combination of reactance and resistance. Is there an answer like that? Um, okay, they didn't go into that detail, but you'll see that uh, it's in opposition to the flow of current in AC. They didn't get more specific than that. So this is the only one that, that fits. Now, impedance matching. Um, this, this is a, a fascinating subject, and it's uh, very practical in real world for you as a ham radio operator. First of all, maximum power transfer occurs when the source and load impedances are equal. There's a, a minor reference in the book to an analogy that, that I find helpful, uh, and that's the transmission in a car. Um, now, how many of you know how to drive a stick? Oh, just about everybody. OK, all right. Well, for those that know how to drive a stick, if you put your transmission in third gear and then try to start from a stop, what, what happens? You don't get any power. You, you don't get hardly any power to the wheels, and you barely move, and you'll probably kill the engine, right? Because uh, yeah, that's because we have an impedance mismatch between the speed uh, and output of the engine and, and the rear wheels. The reason that you have a first gear on a car is to better match that power transfer from the engine to, to the rear wheels. And then at some point, you're moving too fast and you, you've got to shift gears. Well, something very similar happens in electronics. Uh, and the, the key principle is the maximum power transfer occurs when the source and load impedances are equal. And this will come up multiple times. You'll get it from multiple angles. Amateur transmitting equipment is, has about a 50 ohm uh, output. Most antennas have a feed point impedance of 50 ohms that we will use commonly. 
Now, if that antenna is resonant and has the 50 ohm impedance in the middle of the 80 meter band or the bottom of the 80 meter band, if you tune up to the top end of the 80 meter band, it's probably off significantly. So an impedance matching circuit can, can retune that mismatch on the antenna side to what the transmitter wants to see and um, therefore keep, keep the transmitter happy. Modern transceivers, if they sense too much of a mismatch, too high of an SWR, uh, they'll start scaling back. So if you have a 100 watt transceiver, it might only be 10 watts if, if the SWR is too high due to, due to the impedance mismatch. So that, that's why this is very important. So there are several techniques. You can use an, an LC, coil capacitor, pi network. I'll show you a picture of that coming up. Links of coax can be used to transform impedance. And I think we'll be getting that to that in a later chapter. And then special impedance matching transformers uh, is another technique that can be used to match the impedances. Now, because we've got three different things, do you think there might be an all of the above coming our way? Possibly, okay. Impedance matching circuits are often LC circuits made up of inductors and capacitors, which we saw here as well, just stated a little bit differently. And the, the pool questions um, love to do this. They, they'll come at us from different directions with, with similar words. So here's, here's an example. This is a pi network. It kind of looks like the, uh, the, the letter pi. You can kind of visualize that here. Here's a T network. It looks like a T. Just different combinations of coils and capacitors that will cause the impedance on one side to match something that's mismatched on the other side. If you've got an automatic antenna tuner built into your radio, it will figure out the solution to match that automatically. You've got a manual tuner, you've got to turn some knobs and dials to, to match it. And most transmitters won't be too particular if you're within about a two to one SWR. I know we haven't talked a lot about SWR yet, but uh, it, it's not quite as critical as some people make it out to be. But um, these are the techniques that if, if it's way off, you can get it to come close and match. There's another method uh, using transformers. There's only one question like this in the pool uh, so we'll, we'll talk through it, and I'll show you how to estimate it. Uh, you'll notice that this formula is not on your reference sheet. That's because it's, uh, it, it's a really easy one. So a transformer changes the ratio of voltage and current between the primary and secondary circuits. And what we didn't talk about before, we, we talked about turns ratio and voltage between primary and second, secondary. Uh, what we didn't talk about is what impact that has on impedance. That, that's what this slide does. So to get that, we just take the square root of the impedance ratio, and here's something from the pool. What, turn, uh, what turns ratio, in other words, how many turns on the primary uh, divided by the turns on the secondary, what turns ratio is required to change a 600 ohm impedance into a 4 ohm impedance? In this statement right here, take the square root of the impedance ratio, so we've got four, 600 divided by 4, whatever that is, take the square root, and that comes out to 12.247. Anybody cares? Uh, an easy way to estimate this, though, is you'll come really close if you call this 400 over 4. So 400 divided by 4 is 100. What's the square root of 100? It's 10, right? 10 squared is 100. The square root of 100 is, is 10 which is real close to 12.2. So that, that, that's a way that you can estimate this without, without doing the math. Okay, more practice, or as one of my kids once called it, practice. What happens when the, imp what, what happens when the impedance of an electrical load is equal to the output impedance of a power source, assuming both impedances are resistive? A lot of extra words there, but the principle we talked about. When the impedances are matched, we... Source can deliver maximum power to the load, correct. Think of your car if you need to. Which of the following devices can be used for impedance matching at radio frequencies? That was the all of the above. 
Yep. Which of the following describes one method of impedance matching between two AC circuits? We've looked at several possibilities. Which one is represented here? Right, insert an LC network between the two circuits. Anything else look plausible there? It's, it's, uh, it's A. What is one reason to use an impedance matching transformer? Back, back to a principle that we've talked about. Maximize the transfer of power. Some of these, when you put them all together in one place, they almost they, they seem redundant. They're just asking in different, different words. But because you could see any of those uh, on the exam, they're, they're all pool questions. And here's the turns ratio of our transformer problem that we looked at. And you probably remember what it is. The easy way to estimate that is uh, make this 400 divided by 4. Gives you 100, the square root of 100 is 10, which is very close to this. Or you can just remember, uh, it looks like it's the smallest value, if, if that helps you. All right. We just zipped through probably the most complicated part of the sections that we're looking at tonight. Active components. Now, what's the difference between an active component and a passive component, you might be asking? Well, we've already looked at passive components. There are resistors and capacitors and inductors, um, and they will um, exhibit their properties without having any power applied to them necessarily. Active components, voltage is needed, uh, like operational amplifiers, we'll, we'll be looking at, for example, um, and diodes and transistors. They, they all require power or voltage to be applied in the circuit for those components to work. So passive is like resistors, active components is like transistors and semiconductors. So this section will talk about active. Semiconductor components. First of all, P-type and N-type material. I don't remember if we talked about that in the technician class, but silicon um, is a rather poor conductor. And if you use a certain chemical that it's called a dopant, um, you can create an excess of holes. We've got electrons and, and holes in um, electronics. And with material that has an excess of holes is called P-type material. And N-type material is silicon that has an excess of electrons, N negative, P positive. So it, it's the materials that the uh, parts are made out of. It's a highly simplified discussion there, but um, that's good to start with. Junction diodes, that's when you, you take a P-type material and an N-type material and press them up against one another. It's called a junction. Junction diode uses a PN junction to block the flow of current in one direction. Now, the key to a diode is it'll pass current in one direction only, and that's because of the kind of material that it's made out of. So junct, okay, it, it blocks the flow of current in one direction, but it passes the current when you apply the voltage in the other direction. So if you hook the battery up across this diode, and the, the parts are called an anode and a cathode, the n-type material, that's electrons, you see the negative symbols there. The holes is the counterpart on the p-type material. So the anode is connected to the p-type material, the cathode to the n-type material. And if you were to put a battery, negative here, positive here, you'd get current flow. If you reverse that battery, then there would be no current flow. So that's the magic of a diode. Diodes do a lot of other interesting things as well, but that's, that's the, basic, the basic piece. There's two questions that ask about forward voltage. When the diode is conducting, there will be a little bit of voltage drop across the part. For a germanium diode, that's about three-tenths of a volt. So if we had current flowing through this diode and we were to put a, a voltmeter from one terminal to the other, we would see a vo what's called a voltage drop across the diode of about three-tenths of a volt if it's um, germanium. For silicon, the voltage drop is about seven-tenths of a volt. We had a past student uh, that remembered it this way, and I thought that this was rather creative. If you can substitute the three for the R in germanium, that will help you remember it's three-tenths of a volt. For silicon, seven, seven-tenths of a volt. 
I don't know if that's helpful or not, but some people remember it. Any kind of memory tricks or crutches that you can come up with are definitely encouraged, like Emily and Paco and, and uh, Presley. Yes, I, I can't, I, I keep forgetting Presley's name. Now there's ratings for diodes. Here's some pictures of different kinds that you might see. So peak inverse voltage. Now I, I said that a diode will not conduct if it's hooked up a certain way, but there's a limit to how much voltage you can put across a diode in the reverse direction. So if the peak inverse voltage was let's say 200 volts and you put 300 volts across it, uh, the part would probably melt <laughs> and, and short out. So peak inverse voltage is one of the ratings of a diode. So for small signal diodes, it almost doesn't matter if you're uh, making power supplies and uh, rectifiers, it, all of a sudden it does matter. The average, for, um, average forward current, even though a, a diode will conduct in the forward direction, you can put too much current through it. And so you, you'll see that some of these diodes have a heat sink on like this one probably for, for power rectification. If, it, if you pass more current than the diode is rated for, it, it'll melt, usually short, and fail. So you can't exceed the peak inverse voltage, you can't exceed the current rating. And then there's another feature called junction capacitance. When the diode is, is not conducting, uh, there's, it, it's like two metal plates, and there's some amount of capacitance between each side of the diode. And if that capacitance is high, it takes longer for the diode to turn on. And that, that can become important in RF circuits where you're doing switching at very high frequencies. So junction capacitance, when reverse biased, P and N type material act like plates of a small capacitor. The larger the capacitance, the longer it takes to switch to conducting. And at, at high frequencies, that, that can be very important. So those are the three values, three specs that you can look up for, for any any part, any diode. There's different types. Uh, you might have heard of pin diode switching. Uh, transceivers that, that use that are completely silent. They'll go from transmit to receive, back to transmit, like if you're doing CW, and you won't hear any relays clicking at all. That's because it's using pin diode switching rather than, than relays. Low forward voltage drop used for RF switching. And none of these are in the pool but they're just different kinds you're gonna hear of. A shot key diode, low junction capacitance, allows high frequency operation. A varactor, this one is really important. When reverse biased, it acts like a variable capacitor. So as you, put, if, as you change the voltage across a varactor, it will uh, change the capacitance. And that, that's really handy if you're doing something like frequency modulation or phase modulation. Um, that, that part will be critical, heavily used in those applications. And then a, a Zener, or Zener, I call them Zener, um, uses a voltage regulator. A, a Zener will break down when it's uh, reverse biased, but it'll break down at a very specific voltage and won't destroy itself. So Zener diodes are used as reference sources, like uh, the reverse uh, breakdown might be exactly nine volts or exactly five volts. And having an exact voltage reference is very, uh, a very good thing when you're doing power supplies. Gives you a reference to compare to. So not in the pool, but these are things you'll run across in your ham radio career. Junction threshold voltage of a germanium diode. Good. Silicon. Seven tenths. Transistors. All right, those are <laughs> quick pool questions. Transistors uh, have, can have a very high amplification rate and can be used as switches for voltage and current. And there's two states that are important. Saturation is when the transistor is conducting just as hard as it can. It's like a closed switch. Well, where no further increases in input cause the output change. It's saturated, it's, it's conducting as hard as it can the opposite case is cutoff, where it won't conduct anything at all. So we've changed the bias and uh, created these two states, cutoff and saturation. So here's what we might see in the pool. Saturation and cutoff are the stable operating points for a bipolar transistor used as a switch in a logic circuit. 
I've got a diagram of that coming up. So fully on is saturation. It's like a closed switch. And with digital electronics, where everything is in ones and zeros, that, that's why this is very valuable, because a transistor can act as a switch. So here we're fully on, whether it be like a logic one, perhaps, or it can be fully off, which is the cutoff state, and the transistor would act as an open switch. So here we've got a one, here we've got a zero. A little bit more on bipolar transistors. It's called bipolar because we've got P material and N material. We've kind of made a sandwich here. We've got P up against N up against P. It's a silicon sandwich. I don't know what they taste like. I don't recommend that you eat one. So there's three electrodes, emitter, base, and collector. And the flow from the collector to the emitter is determined by the uh, flow between the base and the emitter. So very small changes in base to emitter create a very large change in current flowing from collector to emitter. So the, it acts like a valve. And there's two flavors, there's PNP and NPN. You don't um, need to know this necessarily uh, for the exam, but somebody told me this trick once. If, if you look at uh, junction transistors, here's two kinds, notice the arrows. If it's pointing in, it's a PNP. If it's not pointing in, it's an NPN. So just, just another little memory trick. So we're not pointing in, so this is an NPN, NPN. If the arrow is pointing in, then that's a PNP. Couple more characteristics. Very little base emitter current is required for the collector emitter current to flow. Likewise, to fully switch it on or fully switch it off if you're using it in digital applications. And control of a large current by a smaller current is called the current gain or beta of the transistor. It's one of its specifications. And I like the fire hose analogy here again. Um, the pounds per square inch in a fire hose will determine how high you can shoot the water. That makes sense? So you can get up to uh, 300, between 150 and uh, 300 pounds per square inch in, in a fire situation, in a fire pump. Would you be able to take your hand and put it in front of, of that fire hose and slow the flow? No, it's way, way too much pressure. But the valve on the fire hose, that, that's real easy to move, or much easier to move. And it's similar with a transistor. A very small amount of effort in the base emitter current creates a much, much larger um, collector to emitter current. So that, that's the concept of amplification. Small change in gives you a large change out. And don't try to operate your transistors underwater, by the way. They, they won't work well. That's free. Field effect transistors. We saw the junction transistors. This is another type of uh, transistor. It has three electrodes, the drain, the gate, and the source. See how the gate is kind of nestled right in? This, this is called a channel from drain to source. It's an insulating, or it's on a substrate. Drain source and gate, controlled by voltage between the gate and the source. Here's the source and the gate. It's like the base and the emitter of a junction transistor. And there's a certain kind that may show up again. Metal oxide semiconductors, or MOSFETs, are constructed by, an ins by insulating the gate with a thin insulating layer of oxide. So the gate is actually insulated from, from the channel. So when you apply a voltage to the gate, it tends to pinch off the flow of electrons that, that's flowing through that channel. A couple of other things, uh, because the gate is insulated, it's a very high impedance input, whereas junction transistors are fairly low impedance. So again, what, you, what, you, what you're designing the circuit to do, what you need it to do, will, de will uh, dictate the kind of part that you would apply there. 
There's another little trick. Um, I think I actually learned this from, from Gary. If uh, we've got N channel and P channel field effect transistors, in the symbol, the arrow was always pointing toward the N type material. So this is going to be an N channel field effect transistor. In this case, a junction field effect transistor. The other kind we saw was a metal oxide where we have an insulated gate. Same thing here. For a P channel, the arrow is pointing the opposite way. You don't need to know that for, for this exam. It, it will appear on, in the extra. Practice. What are the stable operating points for a bipolar transistor used as a switch in a logic circuit? It's the two extremes. Well, when our transistor is conducting as hard as it can, that's called saturation, right? When the transistor has current going through it, um, it causes it not to conduct. That's called cutoff. So, so the, those two stable operating points in logic, remember we've got ones and zeros in logic, fully on, fully off. That's why it corresponds to saturation and, and cutoff. Anybody confused? You looked a little confused on that one. Okay. Which of the following describes the construction of a MOSFET? Anybody remember what MOSFET stands for? Metal oxide. Metal oxide field. Field. Yep, good. Yep. And that, that had the insulated gate, remember from the discussion. So the answer that fits, the gate is separated from the channel with a thin insulating layer, correct. Vacuum tubes, everybody's favorite. Yeah. yeah. The reason that we still are concerned about vacuum tubes in today's world is because high-powered amplifiers are still less expensive that use, uh, if they use vacuum tubes. So they're still widely in use. And then, then we've got a, a class of amateurs, and it's a legitimate, legitimate class, and I respect these folks tremendously. That, that work on what's called boat anchor equipment. That's equipment that's back from the, the 50s and 60s that used all, all tubes. Um, so folks that want to restore or operate some of that older equipment need, need to know about tubes. But for all of you, probably amplifiers. So an amplifying, all amplifying tubes have at least three electrodes. The uh, control grid, the plate, and the cathode. Vacuum tubes typically operate at hazardous voltages, and in high power amplifiers, they can be thousands of volts. Um, you will not have a good day if you come in contact with that kind of voltage. You'll have a very bad day. Well, this uh, picture is on the screen. I wanted to point out something else. We didn't talk about the screen grid yet. We've got the control grid, controls the flow through the tube. The screen grid. Uh, do you remember when we talked about capacitors in series? If you have two capacitors in series, the value is greater or less than, than the one capacitor alone. Less, yes. So a screen grid, its primary purpose in a tube circuit is to lower the capacitance between the control grid and the plate. Because if, if you can imagine here to here is some amount of capacitance, from the screen grid to the plate is some amount of capacitance, they're in series, therefore the capacitance between the control grid and the plate is reduced. A little bit more terminology, expanding on what we just talked about. The filament, um, those of you that are familiar with tube equipment or you know, go, go back to the older five tube radios, you notice that they glowed in the dark. In fact, you'll see some uh, ham cartoons that say real radios glow in the dark. That's because the, the tube glows kind of an orange, orangish, reddish color. First so, troubleshooting technique is to look and see which tube isn't glowing. Yeah, which one's not glowing, yep, yep. And that tube is not gonna work. So the filament, it's also called a heater, heats the cathode, causing it to emit electrons. You can, you can say that the heater, this uh, hot element, glowing red hot, 
is actually boiling electrons off the cathode. Those electrons being boiled off the cathode are attracted by the high positive voltage on the plate but are controlled very effectively by the control grid. A very small amount of voltage between the control grid and the cathode controls the flow through the tube. So the cathode is a source of electrons. A control grid, notice it's in blue, regulates the electron travel between the cathode and the plate. The screen grid reduces grid to plate capacitance. We diagrammed how, how that's true then the plate collects electrons. Some people collect stamps, plates collect electrons. It's their hobby. All right, see how much of this we can remember. Which element of a triode vacuum tube is used to regulate the flow of electrons between the cathode and the plate? C. No, C reduces, yeah, control grid, yeah, it controls the flow through. The screen grid's purpose is to lower the capacitance between the, the grid and, and the plate. It's also a triode. Um, yes, triode tube. This, this distractor can't possibly be the right answer because we're talking about a triode. So there won't be a screen grid. Okay, thank you for noticing that. <clears throat> what is the primary purpose of a screen grid? Yep, we kind of beat that one to death. Now we get into some more fun things. Analog integrated circuits. If there's analog integrated circuits, do you think there might be digital integrated circuits? Why, yes, of course. ICs or chips, and I got a couple of them illustrated here. Analog integrated circuits used for amplification, filtering, measurement, and power control. Okay, here's some things we need to look at. A linear voltage regulator is an analog IC. And we can kind of see how that would be, because analog implies a range of values between high and low, not just on and off, which would be the digital case. So a linear voltage regulator is going to be an analog IC used to maintain a power supply output at a constant voltage over a wide range of currents. Can't really see this too well. It's a 7805, but there's 7805, 7809. Um, those these, these devices, you'll put a DC voltage in and you'll get exactly nine volts out or six volts or whatever the part's rated for. An operational amplifier or op amp is an analog IC used for DC and audio circuits. Commonly used for amplifiers and amplifiers again are gonna be, be analog. <clears throat> so the trick here is to remember that the voltage regulator and the operational amplifier are analog ICs. There are also analog ICs that operate at radio frequencies. Um, what we saw back here, this is DC primarily, op amps are, are low frequency AC and audio. We can use integrated circuits at RF frequencies as well for uh, preamplifiers, for mixers, for modulators and demodulators. These are all circuits we'll talk about in future chapters or filters. Then there's something called a MIMIC, monolithic microwave integrated circuit. And it works up through microwave frequencies. It's a little picture of one here. Does anybody have one of these in your pocket right now? Cell phones, yes, your cell phone is full of these things. <laughs> yep, and they're little tiny circuits. With, without these kind of circuits, we wouldn't have cell phones in little packages. So that's a MIMIC. Now we're going to move to digital integrated circuits. So we're going to be talking about ones and zeros rather than a range of voltages like we saw for op amps and voltage regulators. So digital ICs operate with discrete values of voltage and current representing the binary numbers zero and one. Big advantage using binary is that ones and zeros are easy to represent by on and off. We saw how to do that with transistors. Digital, digital circuits can perform computations or control functions. Anything a computer can do, um, a digital IC of the right kind can do. And then CMOS, another word, complementary metal oxide semiconductor. It's popular because primarily, well, it's higher speed, but the pool question points out low power consumption. 
characteristics of digital integrated circuits. What kind of device is an integrated circuit operational amplifier? Remember, I made a real big deal out of two kinds of ICs. Okay, that's an analog. All right, yep. An operational amplifier is, is like, like uh, if, if you can think of an operational amplifier used as an audio amplifier, that, that's, that's going to be an, an analog device because there's a range of, uh, of speech levels that it's amplifying. It's not just ones and zeros. What is term meant by the term mimic? B. And what's helpful to us here is the distractor answers are, are pretty bizarre. <laughs> so if you can't remember, um, but they all go MMIC. So if you didn't have a clue, you might be stuck. Which of the following is advantage of CMOS compared to the older TTL, transistor-transistor integrated circuits? The advantage that we saw was lower, lower power. Yep. Yep. The rest of them make no sense. Which of the following is an advantage of using the binary system when processing digital signals? Binary is going to be ones and zeros, right? Exactly. Now, there's a, a sheet in your book, a page in your book, um, page 4-29. And the reason I'm referring you to that is because this is pretty hard to see. Four dash twenty-nine, and there's only two cases, and I'll I'll have expanded views of each of these. There's two cases that we will be concerned with in the pool questions. That's this one here, which is called an AND gate, and this one, which is called a NOR gate. So these two we'll be expanding on a little bit, but I wanted you to be aware that there's a lot of other combinations. While we're on this sheet, though, <clears throat> one other concept that I wanted to introduce, uh, the, is this one right here. It's called an inverter. And you'll notice that some of these symbols have a little circle on the end. That means the output's going to be opposite of what you expect it to be. And I'll expand on that as we go forward. Digital logic basics. I'm going to talk about gates. Gates will provide AND and OR functions, and I'll explain that. Here's uh, the AND function says that we have to have, and we're going to assume positive logic, so a high is 1. So if we have a high on A AND, notice the word AND, we have a high on A AND we have a high on B, that will cause C to switch high. So A being high and B being high will cause C to be high. That's the only combination of inputs. If these were both low, C would be low. If one was high, one was low, C would be low. If A and B are high, C will be high. And those work with what are called truth tables. So here we've got inputs A and B. And we'll see that there's only one combination that will take the output, which is C high. And that's if A and B are high, C is going to be high. So the concept of and isn't too difficult. It's this and this have to occur for that to happen. The, an OR gate is a little bit different. An OR gate says if either A or, the word OR, if either A or B or both are high, the output's going to go high. So let's see how that works out. If A and B are both zero, the output's going to be zero because neither one of the inputs were high. In this case, B is high and A is low because one of the two inputs, if either A or B is high, then the output is going to be high. There's our one. Here we re reverse the case. A is high, B is low. So A or B being high, the output will be high. If A if both inputs are high, 
the output will be high. So in this case, we get a, a high output from an OR gate with any combination of inputs except if both of them are low. With an AND gate, we had to have both A and B high to get C high, so there was only one combination that would cause the output to go high. Now the other one uh, that, that I, I circled on our big sheet is the NOR gate. Remember I said that uh, the, the little circle causes it to be just the opposite of what you would expect? So this is an OR gate, and you would normally expect if A or B were high, C would be high. But because it has an inverting output, it's opposite of what you would expect. So the truth table is just backwards. If A, if your inputs, um, um, both A and B, are low, that's the one case where the output will be high. In the other combination, you've got a high on either input. You'd normally expect the, the output to be high, but because it's inverting, it's the opposite, zero. Got this, and then some pool questions, and we'll take a break. Now, if we combine, uh, actually, let me flip ahead here. If we combine elements, we've got AND gates and we've got OR gates combined to form other kinds of digital elements. Saw that? Okay, something called a flip-flop. That is what you wear to the beach in this case. It's an electronic circuit that has two stable circuits. You uh, pulse it, it'll, the output will go high. You pulse it again, it'll, it'll go low. It's called a flip-flop. It'll be in one state or the other. Now, sequential logic puts flip-flops in series. So if you pulse the first one, it'll go high, but the second one won't go high until you pulse it again. We'll should see a picture of that. So um, a three-bit counter is, will have three flip-flops. It can count up to eight. So eight pulses have to come in before the output will go high at the very end of the three flip-flops. So the formula is 2 to the third power equals 8. 2 to the third power is 2 times 2, which is 4, times 2 is 8. So a 3-bit counter, one with three flip-flops, can count up to 8. A 4-bit counter would be 2 to the fourth, so it would be 16, double. And then a shift register is a clock array of circuits that passes data in steps. So you, you start out here with a 1, then we set this position to 1, the next time we pulse it, the one moves over here. The next time we pulse it, it moves over here. So this is a four-bit register. Eventually, it'll work all the way through the register and fall out the other end. <clears throat> you know what it falls into? The bit. the bit bucket. Yeah. At least that's what some people call it. So here, here we have it again. This is a flip-flop. Uh, we, we can clock it and provide an input, which will cause the output to flip. If you put three of these circuits in series, you get a shift register or, or a counter. And there's a, a, an excellent website that goes into this in infinite detail, but you probably have as much detail as you can stand right now, right? A few practice questions, then I will take a break. Which of the following describes the function of a two input AND gate? So think about that for a minute, two input AND gate. You could have more than two inputs. We didn't talk about that, but this is a two input AND gate. So we're gonna have A and B high to get C high. Okay, output is high only when both inputs are high. What is the, what, which describes the function of a two input NOR gate? This one you might need to think about a little bit. That had the, the one case where if both inputs were low, that was the only time the output would go high. Yep, and I, I kind of distracted you a little bit with the way I explained it, but output is low and either or both inputs are high. 
depends upon which combination of inputs you had. But this is the only one that's true of the, of the four that are given. Good. How many states does a three-bit binary counter have? Eight. Eight? Yep. What is a shift register? We know it's not D. We know it's not C. It's A, because an operational amplifier is an analog device. So we can get to A just by eliminating the ones that it can't be. Clocked array of circuits, it passes data in steps along the array. And with that, we're, we'll take a break. We'll talk about microprocessors and microcontrollers uh, after the break, and we'll be very close to finishing up this section. And then it, it keeps getting easier from there. All right. Any questions so far before we get started again? You'll have to probably go over some of this stuff for it to, to sink in, but uh, that's okay. Yeah, you'll, you'll, be, you'll get it. Yeah, you'll get it. You'll get it. We're covering an awful lot of stuff tonight. But most of this is if you're going to be working on a radio, yep. building a radio, mm -hmm. stuff like that, not necessarily transmit on radio. Some of it resonates. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But the people that put the questions together wanted you to know enough of the theory of how the radio worked to qualify for, for getting a general ticket. Yep. All right, we'll start with microprocessors and components. This is just general background or, or context. Computer on a single circuit, single IC. It's got all of this stuff built in. So what uh, computers of, of old that had all of these as separate pieces can all be put into one, one chip. And that's what a microprocessor does. A microcontroller is a little bit different in that a microcontroller is designed to handle one specific purpose. Contra contains all the circuitry to control a complete function on one IC. Like you could have a, a microcontroller that, that does frequency counting, for example, or control outputs to something. Usually uh, does not require external memory or support circuitry. Everything's built into the microcontroller. Usually does one specific function. Uh, in a sense, a thermostat in your house, you could consider a microcontroller if, if it was digital, because it's controlling your house temperature. with a bunch of digital electronics, if it's a programmable one. Microcontroller may replace a collection of complex digital circuitry, and that's, that's the point they want us to get. So there could be a whole bunch of different gates and uh, inputs and outputs and ands and ors and nors all built into one chip to provide a, a specific function. Just a picture of some of the things that would be in it. <clears throat> There's some uh, parts that are associated with microcomputers or microprocessors to be aware of and some, some terms we need to know. One is volatile versus non-volatile memory. Non-volatile memory means that when you turn the power off, it remembers what the settings were. Most of our modern electronics work that way. You don't have to reprogram them every time you turn them on. Volatile memory loses the data stored when the power is removed. <clears throat> but non-volatile memory has become so cheap, and the technologies have moved forward that uh, most devices that we'll be dealing with use non-volatile memory. RAM can be written in any order. You might remember seeing the tape drives in the good old days where data was stored there. You had to go from one end of the tape all the way to the other end of the tape if that's where the data was that you wanted to retrieve. Random access, you can go to any, any point in your storage uh, matrix to get it. Then ROM is read-only memory. Stores data permanently, can't be changed. So settings in your thermostat would probably be programmed permanently, except if you're going to change the values of the temperature at different times of the day, then you would program those values into non-volatile memory. But the way that the thermostat works internally would all be contained in read-only memory. When you first power it up, it, it boots it up and it knows how to do something because of the read-only memory programming. 
done at the factory. <clears throat> Interfaces. Well, different parts have to connect to other different parts. Serial interfaces um, have grown tremendously with, uh, with time and technology. Used to be we had serial ports on most computers. Now you can't hardly find a computer that has a serial port because everything is USB. I can't even remember what they look like. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll have a picture coming up because uh, you, you do run into them. If you have a, a, an old piece of equipment that really needs a serial port, you can buy a converter board to go between the computer, USB, and the serial port. So you're, you're not out of luck if, if you have that need. So a parallel interface transfers multiple bits of data in each operation. Some of you remember the old parallel printers and the, the, the big uh, connectors that they had. That was a parallel interface. RS-232 serial interface um, was, was the, the standard with connectors that I'll show you coming up, then being replaced by USB, universal serial bus, which is faster and better, doesn't need as many wires. And a, uh, this one you might see again, a computer and transceiver are often connected using a USB interface. And here's an example of an ICOM 7300 connected with a USB cable to a computer. So if you're running digital modes on the air, um, the computer would take that digital information send it to the transceiver that has an internal, what's called a sound card, built into it, and then cause that to be compatible with the digital modes of the person that you're wanting to talk to on the other end. So it's very common to have, or another application would be, you might want to control the frequency of the radio depending upon settings you put in your computer. Or you might have a, um, uh, uh, you might be connected to a, a networked uh, spotting system that says there's DX on um, 3570. And you'd click a button here, it would automatically tune the radio to 3570. So those are all examples of why you might want digital between a radio and a computer. Would be probably using a USB cable. Then visual interfaces, we've got LEDs. Here's a picture of one by itself on off it used to be we had the uh, light bulbs that you had to change in radios that would burn out <clears throat> now it's all light emitting diodes they pretty much never go bad led is a special diode that produces light when it's forward biased remember we talked about a diode can be hooked up where it's conducting or backwards not conducting a light emitting diode has to be hooked up so it's conducting or forward biased in order to make light compared to the old incandescent light bulbs we had an equipment, indicator lamps. LEDs have lower power consumption, much faster response time. They're on instantly, and they last just about forever. This is a display, an LCD liquid crystal display. And what's important to know about a liquid crystal display is that it requires a light source independent of itself for you to be able to see it. LCDs require ambient or backlighting since the liquid crystal layer does not generate light. Other types of displays um, do. And the way that they work, when voltage is applied to the electrodes on the front panel, the liquid crystals twist and actually block the light. So it has to be a light source to, uh, to make that make a difference. And here's a picture of one. Ah, practice already. Complex digital circuitry can often be replaced by what type of integrated circuit? That should be an easy one. A, yep, microcontroller. What is meant by the term read-only memory? I gave that one to you. <laughs> now, here's, here's a thought question. What, what's write-only memory? Write-only memory is completely useless. <laughs> there isn't any such thing. Gotcha. All right. What is meant when memory is characterized as non-volatile? Yep. Which is very fortunate. If you went to your car radio and you, you have a favorite station, you turned your car radio on and, and when you pushed one, you didn't get your favorite station, you'd be very unhappy. 
because your radio has memories and non-volatile memory. How is an LED biased when emitting light? It has to be conducting forward biased D. Which of the following is a characteristic of a liquid crystal display? Okay. Yep, it has to have some source of light in order to tell the difference from the twisted uh, light. 4.6, practical circuits. And there's, there's a collection of practical circuits we'll be looking at. Power supplies, and I am so thankful that when they redid um, edition nine in our book, they simplified this tremendously. Power supplies used to be a very painful thing, both pool questions and, and teaching. It's a lot easier now. Of course, you won't know the difference because you don't know what the previous version was like. But Gary and I will know. <clears throat> So we're gonna talk about power supplies, batteries and chargers, alternative power like um, sunlight and wind, and we'll talk about connectors. A bunch of miscellaneous stuff all kind of jammed into this section. All right, the hardest part comes first. Now there's two flavors of power supply and rectifier configurations. There's what's called half wave and full wave. Remember our friend, the sine wave was going up and down and bouncing around and kind of like what's on the oscilloscope there. So the sine wave is going through 360 degrees to get back to zero. It starts at zero, goes to 90, it's at a peak, goes back to zero. All right, 180, goes down to the bottom, 270, back up at 360 degrees to zero. So a half wave rectifier allows current to flow in one half of the input AC waveform. All right, that's, remember a diode will conduct one way and it won't conduct the other way. So if we apply an AC signal to the input of a diode, it'll only conduct the positive peaks in this configuration, giving us an output that looks like this. Okay, so here's a positive peak, it lets that through. It won't let the negative peak go through because the diode is reverse biased. The next positive peak comes along, right here. That can pass and so forth. So we, we get an output that's a, a bunch of little bumps, all above zero volts. So it's some value of, of DC, direct current. So we're not letting the other side go through. So it allows current to flow in one half of the input AC waveform, which that's where the 180 degrees comes from, because the other 180 is negative and it won't flow. And an advantage is only one diode is needed. You'll see that coming up next. Now, I said they come in two flavors, half wave and full wave. Well, there's two kinds of full wave circuits. We've got four diodes in a bridge. That's this configuration. It's easy to recognize because of the diamond shaped that this is called a bridge circuit. And then we have what's called a center tap transformer with two diodes. That's this configuration. So we've got a transformer with a center tap. And then each one of these diodes will conduct on alternate halves of the AC cycle. But to get the other side of the circuit uh, to, to flow, that's why the center tap is needed. So the, there's a couple of things about full wave rectifier circuits that you can kind of probably intuit right away where we were only conducting 180 degrees of the AC waveform, we're gonna be uh, passing current all 360. In the case of full wave, that's where we have half wave, 180, we have full wave, that's 360. So two types, bridge and center tapped transformer with two diodes. So here's a full wave bridge, see our diamond shape. And the way that this one works is that, uh, and we won't go through the detail here, but each pair of diodes is conducting on a different half cycle. So we've got these two diodes with, with one half of the cycle, these two diodes with the other half, and we, we get the output across both ends of the bridge. That's why we don't need a center tap. The output is produced during the entire 360 degrees of the AC cycle. And the output is a series of pulses at twice the frequency of the input voltage. All right, let's see if we can figure that one out. So um, 
Well, what we're doing is uh, the, the full cycle, if we start over here, the full AC input cycle goes from here, goes up, back to zero, down, and back. All right, so that's the three, full 360. Because we're um, conducting on the first half of the cycle, that's one. We're also going to conduct on the second half of the cycle, that's two. So in the space of one full wave form, we've got two DC pulses for the positive half and the negative half of the AC. That's why the outputs, uh, the series of output pulses is twice the frequency of the input. So if we had 60 cycles AC coming off a transformer, which, which would be normal for ordinary house current, we would have an output that's a bunch of bumps happening at 120 cycles per second, twice the input frequency, which is why this makes sense. And that's a characteristic of a full wave bridge rectifier. In a half wave, we saw previously, we were only getting one pulse per full AC sine wave cycle. All right, so these will come up again. And then filter circuits. This kind of thing is kind of bad because even though we've got DC, it's bumpy DC. And bumpy DC will cause hum. In other words, if you were powering an amplifier from a power supply that had no filtering, you'd hear a loud hum with anything that was coming through that amplifier. This is called ripple. These little bumps are called ripple. We want to get rid of the ripple. Rectifies, rectifier's pulsed output is unusable as DC because of the ripple. We've got to get rid of the bumps. So we do that with filter networks. It can be one large capacitor. So we're charging up the capacitor to a kind of an average value uh, that is in between what those peaks are, the bumps. So a capacitor will tend to regulate voltage and inductor will tend to regulate current. So they, they can be used in combination. So a filter network is made of, can be made up of capacitors and inductors. These days, as one of our videos uh, commented, uh, Lou French, uh, you don't see the inductors quite as, as much anymore, just large capacitors. But both of these elements can cause filtering to be effective, and it smooths out the ripple. You want the, you want the DC output to be just like a battery, pure DC, and that happens with filtering. So we can smooth out the current pulses and the voltage, capacitors and inductors. And large electrolytic capacitors are, are typically used. <clears throat> safety, power supply safety. Can you get hurt from, from a power supply? Well, a power supply that's only putting out 12 volts DC, you probably aren't going to get hurt from 12 volts. But of course, if you open the cabinet and got across 120, that, that would, uh, you would notice that. that. That could ruin your day. Now, other things that can happen, components can explode or current. So fuses in the primary are used to protect against short circuits or ex excessive current for any kind of a power supply. Then bleeder resistors. Uh, this is an interesting concept. If you've got a high voltage, remember we're talking about tube circuits, and you might have two or 3,000 volts that was needed for, for the plate in a tube circuit. Well, the power supply that's supplying that voltage if it's being filtered by uh, electrolytic capacitors, when you turn off the power and you're not taking anything out of the power supply, those capacitors can hold that high voltage for a long time, days or weeks even. So you can open up a power supply to work on it that uh, you think is perfectly safe. If it's a high voltage power supply, it, it, it can still kill you. <laughs> so what bleeder resistors are, they're fairly high value resistors that are connected across the output of a power supply that will slowly bleed those capacitors and, and discharge it so that af after minutes or, or hours, it, it's safe again. So that's the concept of a bleeder resistor. When you turn it off, it dissipates that voltage. So working on power supplies, wait for the bleeder resistor to discharge energy, even if it's unplugged. And that concern is primarily high voltage power supplies. Now, switching power supplies um, used to be the only thing we had were linear supplies. We had a great big heavy transformer. 
and then some kind of a rectifier and, and filtering arrangement. Modern supplies uh, that, that run our transceivers today, most of them are switch mode. You can get linear or switch mode, and um, I'll have a diagram coming up of what that looks like. Now, switching power supplies are much lighter. They don't require that great big heavy transformer. What they do is uh, they rectify the uh, AC line voltage right as it comes out of the wall uh, and filter it. And then transistors switch current pulses at a very high frequency. A normal uh, transformer connected to a wall socket is running at 60 cycles per second. What's happening with a switch mode power supply is they, they convert that to DC and then chop it all up. It's actually a little oscillator circuit that can be running at 20 kilohertz. It's real easy to make transformers work at higher frequencies, excuse me, smaller transformers. So that's how they work, um, and, and then filter it. So, and the thing to note, high frequency operation allows the use of smaller components. The, those big iron transformers are not needed with a switch mode power supply. So lighter weight inductors and transformers, that's the big advantage. But there's a slight disadvantage too with the switching uh, power supply because they're running at high frequencies and chopping voltage, they can put out uh, hash at radio frequencies. So a switch mode power supply could be a bad thing to use with your radio unless it's designed for amateur radio use, in which case it was designed with the filtering necessary to not put the hash out that, that would uh, be received by your, by your receiver. Are you saying it's smoother power or cleaner power? It's not necessarily smoother or cleaner. Uh, it's just a, a lot lighter. Because you, you're, you're filtering, you want to have pure DC, either with a switch mode or a linear supply. So we, we still need the filtering there. By comparison, linear supplies are very heavy due to their large iron core power trans, transformer, like double or triple the weight. Now some hams won't do, use anything but a linear, because they don't, the earlier switch mode supplies were pretty noisy, but the, the modern ones are, are quite good and less expensive. Here's a lot of the, aircraft use 400 cycle yep. in the yep. aircraft yep. to That's eliminate the weight. inductors, which yep. are, have a lot of weight, yep. and it makes the capacitor smaller. Yep, exactly. Okay, because you have more pulses sure. per second. Exactly. Yep, I hadn't thought of that, but aircraft, they, they care about weight. <laughs> so switch mode is, is good for them. So here, here's a schematic, not a very good one, or a block diagram. So what's happening, we're taking the 120 volts AC right out of the wall and immediately rectifying it. That kind of gives you a hint. If you're working on one with the cover turned off, you could easily uh, be tangled up on 120 volt circuitry. So they're, they're a little dangerous to work on unless you know what you're doing. So there's a bridge rectifier and filter capacitors right out of the wall at 120 volts. And then here's the switching power, the switching, uh, the power switching transistors that chop up that DC. Then we have a high frequency output transformer, another full wave rectifier to the, and we get the DC output that we want. And a control circuit uh, determines the, really the pulse width of the switching that's going on to control the amount of, uh, if, if you want 13.8 volts out, which typically you would for today's transceivers, this switching control circuit would be switching this just fast enough to get that 13.8 out. So these are pretty complicated, but they're much lighter, they're much smaller, and, and they're, they're less expensive. So this is just a little clue of, of what's going on to, to get that output. Uh, what portion of the AC cycle is converted to DC by a half-wave rectifier? Now, why is it called half-wave? Because it's only half of the 360. Yep, that's 180. What portion of the AC cycle is converted to DC by a full wave rectifier? Yep, that's all 360 degrees of the sine wave. Correct. What is the output waveform of an unfiltered, okay, read the words carefully, output waveform of an unfiltered full wave rectifier connected to a resistive load? So the key is, um, it's a full wave, it's going to be a bunch of DC bumps. So we get a series of DC pulses at what frequency? Full wave. It's going to be 
double, right, twice the frequency of the AC input because we're passing DC pulses for both the positive and the negative side of the uh, waveform. <clears throat> what is an advantage of a half-wave rectifier in a power supply? You only need one diode. What type of rectifier circuit uses two diodes and a center-tapped transformer? That's full wave, exactly. Now, the, the bridge um, doesn't use a center tap transformer. So there's some words there to, to watch. Which of the following components are used in a power supply filter network? Okay, to filter, we're probably going to have capacitors and possibly inductors. So the, to filter that bumpy DC that's coming out with all of the ripple in it, capacitors, inductors, will smooth that out to get you back to something that doesn't have hum in it. What useful feature does a power supply bleeder resistor provide? Keep you from getting killed, right? Ensures filter capacitors are discharged when power is removed. Which of the following is an advantage of a switch mode power supply? Well, let's work through them. Faster switching time um, makes higher output. Well, no, that, that's irrelevant. Fewer circuit components, no. Switch mode are actually quite a bit more complicated. Um, so it can't be all of these choices. So it, by elimination, it's got to be C. High frequency operation um, allows the use of smaller components. We get rid of the iron core transformer. Batteries and chargers. I promise it's getting easier as we go. We got less than a half an hour. We're doing great though. We got two flavors of batteries, primary and secondary. I'm not sure what the history is, how they became, uh, got those titles. But primary can't be recharged. It's like an alkaline battery or the old carbon zinc battery. Those are considered primary batteries. You use them once, and throw them away, replace them. Secondary batteries are rechargeable. So it, it's not unusual, especially for higher power equipment, to use a large marine or uh, recreational vehicle storage battery to be used for emergency power backup. But you have to be careful. Um, if you discharge them too far, you'll damage the battery and shorten its life. And this is what you need to know. Minimum allowable discharge voltage for a lead acid battery is 10.5 volts. So if its normal voltage is 12.6 or 13.8 while it's being charged, and you're using it with your radio, and when it gets down to 10.5, you want to turn your radio off or risk damaging your battery or shortening its life. NICADs, now batteries have a characteristic called internal resistance. And the lower the internal resistance, the more current the battery can put out. And the power tools that, that came out <clears throat> um, be, before we had all of the new modern battery technologies were pretty much all NICADs. Nickel cadmium batteries uh, had very low internal resistance and therefore could supply high discharge currents for tools and for transmitters. Um, this I don't think is even in our book, but lithium iron phosphate is becoming extremely popular. It's very light, uh, it can be recharged um, thousands of times, and I've got an example of one uh, here on the table. <clears throat> it's about a third of the weight of a lead acid. So I wanted you to know about it because it'll come up in your ham radio career, if not on the test. It won't be on the test. Now, battery self-discharge gradually reduces stored energy over time, so all batteries slowly lose their charge if they're just sitting on the shelf. And depending on the battery chemistry, that, they, they can start going down in a matter of days. <clears throat> Some will go months before they start losing. So primary cells can't be recharged. You don't recharge your alkaline batteries. So chemistry can't be reversed. Secondary cells may be recharged. 
And for a battery to have its uh, rated lifetime, it has to be charged uh, in a way that's consistent with, the, with that type of battery. Have to use the right kind of charger and don't ever attempt to charge a primary battery. And here's just a reference chart, some batteries that, you're, that you've seen before, triple A's, double A's. Uh, and it, it's very interesting to see what the average, uh, the higher the number here, the more output capacity you have, or the longer the battery will last. And notice the one that's way up here, the D alkaline, 14,000 milliamp hour, milliamp hour rating before it goes dead. And then of course we've got some rechargeables here. This is just kind of a reference chart to put this in perspective. And the circuit symbols a single cell, like a 1.5 volt alkaline would be this kind of a symbol. You've got a multi-cell battery. Uh, let's say you, you have multiple cells to get up to 12 volts. This is what the symbol would look like. All right, maximum allowable discharge for a lead acid. 10.5. Average advantage of low internal resistance of NICADs. Because of the low internal resistance, it can put out a lot more, a lot more current, high discharge current. Alternative power. Here we've got Mr. Wind and Mr. Sun, or Mrs. Wind and Mrs. Sun, depending upon how you'd like to put it. Solar power, okay, Vo photovoltaic conversion. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Photovoltaic conversion is the process by which sunlight is changed directly into electricity. Wind generators use propellers. You've all seen wind farms as you're driving around the country. Propellers drive DC generators and charge batteries. Solar power uses a special kind of diode. And those diodes, when light is focused on them, the photons, the light, um, excites the electrons and can generate a forward voltage across the diode junction. Now, when a, a solar cell is fully illuminated, the sun is shining on it, the open voltage across that cell is about half a volt DC, 0.5 volts DC. And you can combine multiple cells to get a higher voltage. So you'd have to combine 24 of these in series to get a 12 volt battery or 12 volt power source. So that says for solar power. Um, now, when the lights go out, when the sun goes away, the, uh, you don't want the batteries that you're charging with the solar panel to discharge back into the uh, solar cells. So a diode is used to prevent that. For solar power, diodes prevent batteries from discharging back through the panel during low or no illumination few things there to watch. Alternative storage. Now this is a battery rack. Uh, cell site towers, a lot of times you'll see a rack like this if the AC goes away. Uh, or if you're doing a lot of output uh, from a solar, solar or wind, they're going to be charging big, big battery banks to provide power when the wind is not blowing or the sun is not shining. Excess power needs to be stored during peak periods. Battery is most common. Disadvantage of using wind, <laughs> no wind, no power. Same thing with solar, no sun, no power. What is the reason that a series diode is connected between a solar panel and a storage battery that's being charged by the panel? Well, if the sun goes away, you don't want the battery to discharge back through the panel. Yes. Correct. Which of the following is a disadvantage of using wind? What if the wind stops blowing? So the disadvantage, a large energy storage system is needed to supply power when the wind goes away. What is the name of the process? Oh, big fancy term here. What is the name of the process by which sunlight is changed directly into electricity? Yep. <laughs> you can't say it, but you can recognize it and get the answer right. That's acceptable. What is the approximate open circuit voltage from a fully illuminated silicon 
photovoltaic cell. That was our half a volt, yep. And then connectors, we'll fly through this pretty quick. Plugs are installed on cables. There's smart so-called RCA plugs or phono plugs. Jacks on equipment, you got adapters to adapt anything to anything. And then keyed connectors are connectors where you can't put them in backwards. That's what a keyed connector is. For audio, you'll see all kinds of stuff in your consumer electronics equipment. A lot of these are used in ham radio as well. We talked about the RCA phono plug used for audio connections. And then we've got DIN connectors, a microphone interconnects between equipment. Um, just another style of connector. It's round with multiple pins. I put this one up because it's so common. This is called a TRS plug. Uh, your quarter inch phone or quarter inch plug on your headphones that you plug into your stereo at home or your eighth inch plug that you plug into your cell phone headphones. Um, those are, are TRS. We've got tip, ring, and sleeve. So you'd have like uh, the right audio, the left audio, and the common <clears throat> in an audio connection. So tip, ring, sleeve, or TRS plug. You see those all the time. You'll see that terminology. Power connectors, all kinds of different ways. And I've got some samples here. The Anderson power pole, and I've, I've got one up here as well, are becoming extremely popular in amateur radio. RF connectors, um, we've got BNC, N, SMA, all kinds of different things. Again, some samples here if, if you want to look. But it's a means of getting RF output power from your radio to your antenna or from your antenna into your receiver. All comes through RF connectors. There are some that are extremely common, which is why they're in the pool. The so-called UHF connector, which doesn't mean it's necessarily used much at UHF. It's just what it was called when it first came out in the 1940s. <clears throat> this is an SO239, which you see on a lot of antennas. This is the, uh, or PL259, the SO239 is the, uh, the female side. Commonly used up to 150 megahertz. The UHF connectors up to about 150. End connectors, moisture resistant, up to 10 gigahertz. There's a picture of one here. You can see that little red seal inside. That's why they're moisture resistant. SMA connectors are small threaded connectors. Um, and you'll see them on the antennas of handhelds. I've, I've got one here if you want to look at it. But the, that, that's an SMA connector. Work up to several gigahertz. So note the things that you need. Data connectors, uh, DE9 or DB9. There was nine pin, there's 15 pin. There's the different flavors of these serial connectors. The DE9 is a good choice for a serial data port. Of course, we don't see many of those these days because everything is going USB. Practice, what, which of these connectors used for RF at frequencies up to 150? See, that's our favorite PL259. Which of the following describes an N-type connector? Moisture resistant RF, yep. SMA, that's that small threaded connector. Like used on a handheld, which I've got up here. Which of the following connectors would be a good choice for a serial data port? That's D, yep. Which connector commonly used for audio signals? RCA. RCA phono. Yep, C. And then basic test equipment. Mm -hmm. Getting a little tight on time, but we'll get through this. <clears throat> uh, the two things that I want you to go away with are the, well, the, the top piece of test equipment that you probably want before anything else <laughs> is a, 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 a meter, voltome milliammeter probably your first piece of test equipment. <clears throat> and for $40, I think you can get these at uh, Lowe's. I think they've got them at Lowe's. It might be a little bit, these are Amazon prices. Full blown digital meter with uh, peak hold and uh, it, this doesn't do current, but it does everything else. Highly recommended for a first meter. The Gardner Bender meters, I think are available at Ace Hardware. This one's like $12. 
but uh, either of these will serve you very well as, as a first piece of test equipment. So there's analog and digital meters. These are analog. It's got a needle that moves. Digital, we've got a display. Analog meters, a lot of people prefer, prefer using an analog meter when you're doing tuned circuits, because as you're tuning a circuit, it's slowly increasing and decreasing. And to see that uh, rise and fall, it's easier, a lot of people find it easier to use an analog meter. So analog meters are useful for finding a peak or minimum reading, such as when adjusting a tuned circuit. Advantage of a digital meter is that it offers better precision for most uses. Because the, uh, see we've got like th three possible decimal place places here. It's awful hard to read an analog meter to that level of precision. <clears throat> Doesn't mean it's accurate necessarily. Don't recommend harbor freight meters, by the way, because this is probably more accurate than the harbor freight meter. I had to say that for Gary. He loves harbor freight meters. He hates them. So digital meters, better precision for most uses. You can have some special features like auto ranging, peak hold, frequency and capacitance. That little $40 meter does all of those things that, I, that are in this list. And when measuring voltage, the meter should have a high input impedance to place the minimum load on the circuit being measured. And the way I like to think of that is if, if you're standing on a scale and somebody's putting their thumb on it, you won't get an accurate weight reading, right? So you want the, the effect, you don't want anything affecting the measurement. So if the meter is loading down the circuit, it's providing a parallel resistance to ground and the, ac the accuracy of the reading will, will not be as great. So that's what, a, a, and digital meters typically have like a 10 meg ohm uh, input. So digital meters are great that way. They don't load down the circuit that you're measuring. Why is high input impedance desirable? Well, it decreases the loading. That's what we just talked about. Gives you a more accurate reading. Advantage of a digital, oops, I didn't mean to go that far. Advantage of digital compared to analog. C, better precision for most uses because it's got multiple, um, multiple decimal points or significant digits, you could, you could say. What is, uh, what is an instance in which the use of an instrument with analog may be preferred over an instrument with digital? That was our tuned circuits friend, adjusting tuned circuits. Here we have an oscilloscope. Provides this visual uh, display of voltage against time. The oscilloscope is better than digital voltmeter for measuring fast changing complex waveforms. Because things you'd never see on a meter, you can see very easily on a scope. Uses horizontal and vertical channel amplifiers. It's kind of a little TV set. So you've got horizontal and vertical stuff going on. Here's some of the things you can measure with an oscilloscope. It's the best thing to use when checking keying waveform of a CW transmitter. If those of you that get QST magazine uh, in their product reviews, you'll see that they usually have pictures of the keying waveforms. Those are measured with a scope. And you can see the output of your transmitter. Attenuated RF output may be connected to a scope to check for the RF envelope. Transmitter model monitoring, you can use a conventional oscilloscope or in the good old days, this is a Heath kit station monitor. That, if you got one of these, Gary, I know you've got some kind yeah, of- Yeah, I have a, a later version. Yeah. yeah. All right, what item of test equipment contains horizontal and vertical channel amplifiers? That would be the scope I'm seeing in O. Which of the following is an advantage of an oscilloscope versus digital? That was our- complex waveforms, right? Yep. They go by too fast for any other kind of a measurement. What are, which of the best instrument to use for keying waveforms? That was our oscilloscope again. What signal source is connected to the vertical input of an oscilloscope when checking the RF envelope pattern of a transmitted signal? It would be a sample of the transmitter's power output. It says attenuated because a high power amplifier would blow up a scope if you yeah, put it straight across. All right, impedance and resonance measurement. Uh, here's a couple of antenna analyzers here. Antenna analyzer may contain an RF signal generator, a frequency counter, SWR bridge, and so these antenna analyzers just do all kinds of stuff. 
So you connect it to the antenna and feed line to check out your antenna and feed line. SWR measurements can tell where the antenna is resonant. You can also measure feed line characteristic impedance. There's a question that says, what else can you use an antenna analyzer for? That's an answer. And because it uses a very small signal to generate its test results, if you've got strong nearby signals, that can interfere with the readings. So that's why strong signals from nearby transmitters can affect the accuracy. And here are some different kinds. Directional wattmeter can be used to measure forward and reflected power, to, which detects mismatches in your transmission line and antenna. And then a field strength meter is a device that just senses what, it's, uh, what the RF is around it. So it can be used to monitor the relative RF output when making antenna and transmitter adjustments. And it can measure the radiation pattern of an antenna. If you walk all the way around an antenna with a field strength meter, you can see where the, the lobes are. Practice. Which of the following must be connected when using an analyzer? Um, so we've got an antenna analyzer. We've got to connect it to the antenna and feed line. Which of the following can be determined with a directional wattmeter? Forward, reverse, so that would be standing wave ratio. I know we're going really fast. I want to get you out on time. Which of the following instruments may be used to monitor relative RF output when making antenna and transmitter adjustments? That was our field strength meter. Yep. Which of the following can be determined with a field strength meter? Well, the radiation pattern of antenna, how, how much uh, output is occurring at, as you walk around the antenna. Or you'd have to walk a quite a long distance from the antenna to make this work, but that, that is the answer they're looking for. What problems can occur when using an antenna analyzer? Strong external signals can affect the accuracy. What is the use for an antenna analyzer other than measuring SWR? Talked about determining the value of an unknown piece of coax, measuring the input impedance, measuring the impedance of coaxial cable. If you get a coaxial cable from a ham fest and it has no markings on it, you might want to know if it's 50 ohm or 75 ohm cable. An antenna analyzer can help you with that. And that's the end of chapter four. And we ended 30 seconds early. <laughs> I'll be hanging around for a few uh, minutes yet, putting all this away. So feel free to come up and look. We've, we've got a uh, SWR meter here. This is the uh, the $40. Uh, oh, it's very accurate. Yes. Yeah. This, yeah. Every, everybody wants a fluke. This, this is a fluke meter. So it doesn't measure current, but it does everything else. And some connector and battery examples are up here. So thank you for hanging in there with us tonight. This, this was a, a long, intense evening. We covered a lot of material. Review will be critical. So we'll see you next week. Gary will be up for chapter five. So you'll want to read chapter five.